welcome to our very special Facebook live event. We're from the QRMR Burghopper buildings in Hurston, Queensland. Apologies for those overseas for the timing. Uh, we have with us two asthma experts today uh, and they're going to help us on the impact of a new treatment that could really help uh, those with asthma and struggling with severe asthma. First, let me introduce Associate Professor Severin Navarro. She's the head of our mucosal immunology lab here at QMR Berghofer, and she's working on a new protein that was derived from a natural uh, synthesis from the hookworm. Maybe more about that later. And this new protein uh, is actually called anti-inflammatory protein 2. And it looks like at this stage in the lab that this can actually assist your own immune system to reboot therefore treating asthma, not just the symptoms. And we're also joined by uh, Dr. Alastair Cook, who is, uh, works at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital, also the Wesley, and has an asthma clinic at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital, and he's a thoracic physician, and really very, very keen to see some better treatments for your patients with severe asthma. That's right. Thank you for your questions. We had a lot emailed prior, and we'll get started straight on your questions. Thank you so much for sending them in. So Angela Jones asked online, this is uh, probably for you, doctor, what triggers asthma in adults and when they didn't have the condition as a child? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I guess um, it's, I, we've traditionally always thought of asthma as a condition which uh, often affects children and then some grow out of it and some do not. And uh, we're now increasingly realising that it, like, asthma can very easily develop in anyone and we now appreciate the concept of adult onset asthma so that is that is a thing that we do see what triggers it i mean it, it's well i guess what defines it is inflammation um, and the trigger of it sometimes there's a defined event be it an infection uh, for example um, whether whether that defined event is then causing asthma or not it's probably more of a case of the underlying inflammation being unmasked by by some triggering event um, it really is different for different people so there is no uh, one-size-fits-all answer to that question um, it's just I guess the key point is that asthma can develop at any age um, in children in, in adults even elderly adults Okay, so we're calling it anti-inflammatory protein 2. Let's call it APE2 for the purposes of this Facebook Live event. Would APE2 from Gail Key work for smokers for them? Um, I guess um, Alistair can chime in, but um, we uh, have preclinical evidence that uh, it is beneficial for allergic asthma. Um, smokers' uh, lungs are a bit different because it's more of a mechanical problem. It's also it has an, uh, an underlying inflammatory component, so there's potential scope for APE2, but ultimately um, it is really about uh, rebooting, like you said, uh, the immune system, while um, smoker's lung uh, or COPD is more of a mechanical issue. Mm. Uh, so, so at this stage, we really don't know. Yeah, I think it very much depends on the diagnosis. I mean, if this is someone with asthma who also smokes and the smoking is triggering the, um, the asthma, then, then it, then it um, certainly could work. Um, at the same time, there'd be other uh, lines of management, for example, um, helping the patient stop smoking. Uh, if it's more of a, a direct sort of smoking-related lung disease, such as an emphysema, as you said, there's often more mechanical uh, factors there rather than inflammatory factors. So uh, it, it is difficult to say, but um, you know, we, we would often take a broad approach in someone with more smoking-related emphysema, uh, including such things as rehabilitation and helping them clear any, any sort of sputum, for example. And any sort of additional anti-inflammatory medications would just work in parallel to that. Thanks so much for that question, Gail. Uh, thank you for sending these in. And your question, we can answer that too. All you have to do is pop it in the comments box now as we go along and we'll get to yours hopefully as soon as we can. Wendy Powell asks, does this mean, given that this is derived from a, a protein that was found in hookworms and it helps protect us, should we stop worming our kids? 
This is a really good question. Um, look, the problem with uh, live worms is that uh, they secrete uh, ape 2 in smaller quantities, but they also secrete a lot of other components. And these other components can interfere with uh, other conditions like eczema, for example, and exacerbate it. So um, if there are no other conditions, I would still recommend, and again, I'm not a GP, uh, I don't give medical advice, but I, would, I wouldn't I would encourage people to keep the worms because they, after all, they are quite uncomfortable. Um, uh, so the, 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 the best way to go is to still have uh, a, a synthetic protein, a medication that's pure, controlled, where we know exactly what the effects are, uh, rather than just uh, using worms themselves. So my recommendation in regards to the immune system only is let's have kids play and get mucky and dirty and have fun. Um, if they have worms, well, uh, probably they need to be dewormed uh, just for the comfort of things. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to bring it to, uh, to the public uh, at some point soon. That's an interesting question. Kingsley Grail says, can this potential breakthrough help with bronchiectasis, uh, where airways and lungs are damaged, causing them to become permanently widened? I guess that's you, Alice. There. Yeah, yeah bronchiectasis. I mean, I think, um, well, well, plausibly in that, you know, we may use anti-inflammatory uh, treatments in the but similar to my answer in the previous question, um, you know, it's as part of a broad approach. And, and bronchiectasis, once again, has other mechanical uh, um, interventions, helping clear sputum, for example, and that, that really is the cornerstone of treatment. So um, the other point to make is bronchiectasis is, is a big umbrella term, and there's a few, there's many different types of inflammation that can can go into that. I mean, certainly it's good to have any additional um, medication in our, in our arsenal there. Yeah. But we would certainly take te steps to define exactly what sort of inflammation is contributing uh, to that bronchiectasis and, and go from there. Thank you, Kingsley. And this is from Edna Haslam. Uh, there's a few questions from Edna. We'll try to get to all of them. But other than the removal of allergens, are there any practical strategies that parents can use to prevent episodes in young children? Uh, yeah, I mean, so it depends. Um, so, so this is sort of more general advice. Um, you know, I mean, removal of allergens is okay. I guess we're, we're talking development of episodes of asthma. Well, it depends. I mean, I guess it's really just about defining whether this is a diagnosis of asthma and, and then um, for, for any child to be on appropriate treatment of that and sort of going to see your GP about that. that that's really the most important thing. Um, removal of overt allergens um, that are defined to be causing the asthma is something that can be done as long as it's not too uh, disruptive. I mean, I've, I've had patients who feel compelled to vacuum the carpet twice a day and or rip up the carpet or, or take down all the curtains. And, 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 I, and I think any sort of allergen avoidance strategy is only just one part of, of a larger uh, in, intervention for anyone with asthma, including anti-inflammatory medication, steroids, inhalers, for example. That's really the cornerstone. Mm. Um, the other point I'd make is actually defining what the cause of you can you can objectively um, define the link between uh, the allergen and the asthma in any given patient we've got some yeah objective tests for well that. for the moment leave your curtains up leave your carpet down yes yes absolutely <laughs> thank you so much uh, Luke says how much would the cure be when available Oh, that's, I guess, for you, Severin, but do you really know that at this point? No, that's very difficult to say, and that's something that would be established uh, later down the track, especially once a pharmaceutical company may uh, will get involved, hopefully. Yeah. Um, uh, we're hoping for a low-cost uh, medication because it wouldn't be very complicated to produce, but again, unfortunately, I can't really answer this question. Uh, coming on online now on Facebook from Tanil. I don't know anything about clinical trials. How long will it take to go from clinical trial to availability of the treatment for the public? All going well. Uh, will participants of the clinical trials be adults or children? I guess that's further down the track too. Yeah, 
hopefully uh, sooner than later, and this is uh, why we've done the tax appeal campaign, um, because we're fairly close to um, going into our first clinical trial, uh, funding pending, obviously. Yeah. But um, I can answer for sure that we would first go into adults, very likely because of uh, the amount of regulations that there would be to go first into children. So we need to first determine safety in human. Uh, and so, uh, hence that first step with the clinical trial. From that first safety trial to market, it will definitely be another few years, I'm sorry to say, but again, it depends on funding. Um, it's all about people getting involved, uh, companies being involved, partnership. Um, it could go quickly if we manage to raise the funds, or it could go longer uh, if we have to just really do that fundraising. Um, so this is really the limiting factor at this point. Now, uh, another one coming on online, uh, Mimi says, can I stop my asthma treatment on days when it's not too bad, Dr. Halstead? Mimi, I can give general advice, but um, this is probably something to talk uh, directly to your GP about. So that's the first point I'll make. Um, so, I mean, as a general comment, people can stop their asthma treatment, um, but we... We, we do it differently for everyone. We take into account the severity of their symptoms, the frequency of their symptoms, and there's, there's very good um, objective ways that we can measure how good their asthma control is. And if asthma is well controlled on certain medications, we, would, we uh, will frequently wean them back. Um, ultimately, stopping them outright, well actually, uh, correct, I'll correct that, um, stopping regular inhalers outright right. and can sometimes go to just being used as required. That's a general that's a general comment. It's very hard to give a one set size fits all answer to that. I'll just go to this question now because I think it fits in pretty neatly, uh, Alistair, mm. as, uh, about the long term impact of preventive medication in general. Mm. Yeah, I mean I guess I guess it's a it's balancing the impact of preventive medication versus the impact of not of untreated asthma and, and, and I think that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Um, depends what the preventer therapy is. I mean inhaled corticosteroid treatment which is the cornerstone of treatment is a safe medication and the benefits of taking it do outweigh the, um, the risks of not taking it. Um, other preventive medications such as oral steroids, which is something we try and shy away from, do have uh, quite significant side effects. Weight gain, um, control, contribution to osteoporosis come to mind. Um, so uh, the, so the, 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 again, depends on the individual patient. Some people um, have asthma perfectly well controlled by the inhaled steroids, but some people don't. And um, I mean, that, that sort of brings back to, to why we're here in the first place. Yeah. It's nice to have an additional uh, tool in the arsenal. Um, all of these preventer treatments don't necessarily uh, change the natural history of the underlying uh, asthma. They, they just... ...additional tool there. I think would be immensely valuable. It's well. a delicate balance, clearly, mm. and for you and your patients that have severe asthma where it's life-threatening and really, really scary, to have something like ape 2 come to market mm. and completely change that, mm. uh, gee, we don't want to do your own business, though. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Amy has three questions, Amy. A little bit greedy, but we'll see how we go. Do you need to use a preventer day? Address whichever you like first. Then. Yeah, I mean, w with the same disclaimer that applies to, to, to before, that, that this, these are general comments and um, and uh, your usual GP is the best person to ad address these questions. But I guess the key one is, do you need to use a preventer daily? And that depends on... Yeah. Th that depends on... Your asthma. Um, depends on your asthma. Some people don't need to be on preventer daily and can just have uh, reliever medication as required. Some people do need to be on preventer daily, and that and that's influenced by how frequent symptoms are and how well controlled it is on on medication and whether it needs to be stepped up or down. The horse voice. Asthma. Um, can asthma cause horse voice? Look, um, as an adult lung doctor, um, you know you, this is a specific question about children, so so that's probably another disclaimer I need to make. Um, 
there are conditions out there that can mimic asthma, um, which uh, can cause a hoarse voice. And inhaler therapy itself can contribute to a hoarse voice as well. So, oh. so once again, that's, that it, that's, uh, it's hard to give specific advice on that specific uh, question, and that's probably a good one for your, your own for your GP. Your own GP, yeah. Uh, now, we get to some questions we had earlier as well. This is from Elaine Jarvis, and she says, My granddaughter, 18, has very bad asthma until she was about eight. Nothing since. However, she has a lung capacity test recently, and the results weren't good. How can she increase her lung capacity? Hmm. I mean, I think that so um, you can you can it can affect your lung capacity having uncontrolled asthma. Absolutely, it's a it's a process called airway remodeling. So so that's potentially what could have contributed to this. Mm -hmm. What is more relevant is uh, symptoms. Um, and if the and if, and if your granddaughter's going well and she's got no symptoms, that's that's really good, as well as exacerbations. Uh, and once again, if your granddaughter's having uh, frequent exacerbations, that's that's something that you know we can intervene in. But um, if she's not, then they they're actually quite reassuring things. Um, how do you increase your lung capacity? What's more relevant is how do you reduce your symptoms and how do you reduce your risk of exacerbation? Because if you can reduce those risks it doesn't quite matter so much what the um what the numbers on a lung function test are as long as you are symptom free uh, and the treatments around that are kind of the treatments that we have at our disposal as well as the treatments we're talking about today you know this, the, i guess the goals of any treatment would be to suppress any inflammation to to improve uh, asthma symptoms uh, as well as flare-ups. So ideally reduce them down to none at all. Do people function quite well with a lower lung capacity? Yep. No problem. All right, that's a great question. Thanks, Elaine. Can I add uh, something? Of because course. Um, what's quite reassuring about APE2 and completely different to other drugs is in preclinical setting, um, it prevents airway remodeling and allows the lung to repair itself. So this is a unique um, differentiation point about APE2 where uh, we could uh, prevent this from happening. Um, not only we would uh, reboot the immune system, uh, preventing further, hopefully further um, attacks, but also uh, manage better uh, this loss of lung capacity and lung function. It, I know it's been a long road, but uh, Sajinda is asking how long have you been researching APE2, the anti-inflammatory protein? Yes. Um, it's definitely been over seven years. Uh, it's, as research, I'm sure everyone's familiar, it takes a long time. Um, but uh, before we were convinced we had a good drug candidate, we had to um, have absolutely irrefutable proof that it was working uh, in preclinical setting and understand how it worked and what it did uh, to the immune system. So this in and of itself takes a lot of resources, a lot of time. Uh, but once we um, had this evidence, uh, yeah, it, it is unfortunately a long process from discovery till, um, you know, patenting and, and commercial development. It's a big leap, but you're not done yet. That's, that's right, not done by uh, far. Ian asked, Ian Harris said, uh, may I suggest that long COVID induced severe asthma may be included in the research? I've recently experienced it. I would be willing, with my, within my obvious constraints of age, I'm 90, a continuing effects of long COVID to assist where I can. Looking forward to your response. I think there's a clinical trial participant right there for you. <laughs> that sounds, uh, we might take you up on that, Ian, but uh, yes, um, uh, this might be a little bit down the track, but we're very hopeful that uh, once we uh, managed to bring APE2 to the clinic with the first safety trial, with the first trial for asthma, we can extend its potential indication to other uh, conditions and um, long-term COVID and COVID-induced asthma is definitely in, uh, uh, in our thoughts because it is a, a, a concerning condition. How do you see this being delivered? At the moment, it's a day-to-day, hour-by-hour management system. Um, so far from what we know in the laboratory setting is that um, it would be taken orally, like in the form of a pill or potentially drops. Um, it's something that we'll have to define it further with the uh, commercial partner. But for now, it's through the mouth, so something very convenient to take at home. Um, and then uh, a short course of treatment, uh, maybe 
um, one take um, daily for a few days. That's what we've done in the lab anyway. Um, for uh, a few weeks uh, in the lab, we know that it's up to three months, yeah. but that's just as far as we've gone. We don't know, it could potentially be longer. Uh, in people, it might be a bit shorter, but that's not something that requires to be taken daily, um, continuously, which it is really good. Sounds like it'll have a longer shelf life than some of the um, management treatments we have now that have a quite a short expiry, don't they, Alistair? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but, but, but I guess to, to build on um, your, your point, Severin, it's, it's a... Um, it's you know, the, the the current medications, the inhaled steroids that we do have, which are the cornerstone of our treatment, are are effective, but it does require people to take them and, and um, take them when someone should be on preventive therapy. They generally should be on it a day, once a day, or twice a day. And you know, some people are fantastic. Most people are. Um, there, there's some people who might struggle to take daily medication and then there's of, often technique issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so again, just having something else there for, for some of those uh, patients where it might be challenging to take medications every day, I, I think would be valuable as well. Mm. I've got a follow up question from Tanil. Uh, are you able to explain asthma flare ups that seem to be predominantly a dry cough? My two year old is highly suspected to have asthma. He's on a flixotide and Montelukast. Flixotide alone didn't work. He still needs hospital and oral steroids. He used to have quite obvious wheezing as symptoms. Now it's more of a case I'll notice a persistent dry cough that seemed to be laboured breathing and there doesn't seem to be an obvious audible wheeze. Although doctors suspect it'd still be there and his chest is too light to hear, uh, too tight to hear. I just get confused because everyone says a wheeze is asthma, but sometimes for me the wheeze is most obvious symptom. I donated to the research because I hope my son can have his treatment one day if it can cure him. So do we. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Tanil. I mean, really the, the, your specific your, your question is quite uh, specific for the for the forum, and um, but yes, thank you for your for your donation. <laughs> a very a very clear disclaimer. This mm. is something that you should really discuss with your GP because it's quite technical and involved. Mm. But we really appreciate your um, donation. We hope that we can be a part of the cure. But I guess something we could say about it is the complexity of asthma, yeah. right? Yeah. That it's multifactorial, yeah. it's not straightforward to diagnose, especially yeah. in young children. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's understandable the, the, ish, the stress, I guess, and the anxiety of the parents to just yes. manage this from mm. seeing the, the child at home all the way till diagnosis and then finding a treatment. Absolutely. And I know you mostly deal with adult asthma, yep. Alistair, and I can imagine how stressful that is for adults, but mm. when you compound that with a child who's not really the best at communicating their symptoms, it must mm. just make it so difficult. Absolutely. And I imagine 8-2 would then take away the need for you to be understanding the communication from a child, which might not be perfect. Well, I doubt that would be that easy. Um, I, you know, just like any medication, we'd want to know that we're giving it for the right reason, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to a child. But um, uh, if it's really about re-educating the immune system and there's a, a direct benefit and it's definitely uh, prescribed by a, a, a doctor, yep. um, then I can't imagine so. But uh, again, we need that evidence, you know, that, uh, yeah. that going to the clinic to really get going otherwise it's only preclinical information so far which is really interesting and it's amazing but again like we just need to move forward and we can do that with your help thanks so much for the mm. questions they're rolling in on facebook uh rob says hi how is eight two taken i think you've covered that severin um you're hoping that will be an oral delivery that's right yeah oral and certainly not daily probably more likely monthly yeah i can Imagine so far from what we've seen in the lab that it might be just a short course treatment for uh, relief that might take several weeks, maybe a few months, and then probably we'll have to take it again. So in the sense that uh, one course, one dose, and it's cured, I doubt it will be so simple because humans are very complex, unfortunately, and um, there's so many things that can cause inflammation that are um, independent of asthma itself or the allergen itself. Um, it could go through you know, um, exacerbation due to a viral infection. So we're not completely 100% um, uh, one time and boom, it's done. 
uh, but it might be just definitely less mm -hmm. than corticosteroids. Uh, uh, but it, it's a potential cure in the sense that we will reboot the immune system and make it more tolerant against allergens and allow the lung to um, repair itself uh, while it's getting a reprieve from inflammation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, we can't say it's just one time, it's not magical, mm. and humans are a lot more complex than this. Mm. And we need to get it to that point where we can find out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Shannon says the A2 treatment, can it be given to children? I think you've partly covered that, and would it work in adults? Yeah, I guess um, there might be some confusion around here. So um, we're um, seeing A2 going first into adults. Um, it will definitely work for both children and adults. Um, our um, our suspicion at this point, again, from all preclinical pre settings, is that um, if given early, like in children, we might have a chance to prevent allergy from developing. Um, this is the absolute novelty about this protein. Um, but uh, in adults, it will work as a treatment as well, as it would in, in children. It's just um, the fact that it could have a chance from um, helping uh, young populations from not developing the disease altogether, that would be quite phenomenal. Uh, but otherwise, as a treatment, absolutely. Yeah, and Julie says, are there implications for this with other related diseases, lung diseases, allergies, and gut diseases? Look, implications is a very complex word because I think you're talking about um, side effects. Um, so, so far, we are seeing very, absolutely no side effects in, again, laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the phase one is what's gonna help us um, get through yeah. because we will be able to determine if there are any side effects in mm -hmm. humans. Uh, so that's all the safety component that we need to go, uh, all the checklist. Yeah. Um, from, that, from what we can see in preliminary evidence is that there, are, there isn't um, appear any apparent side effects. It doesn't suppress the immune system, so that means um, we were still able to respond to bacterial or viral infections, yeah. which is absolutely important. Um, and it's really just very targeted to um, resetting tolerance and the ability of the immune system to self-regulate when exposed to allergens. Uh, or autoantigens for autoimmune diseases. It seems very hopeful that this might work with other diseases as well. Yeah, it, it indicates that anywhere uh, tolerance is breached, yeah. whether it is an allergen, again, food antigen, or um, uh, an autoantigen for autoimmune diseases, uh, there's a scope for ape 2 to work. Uh, but uh, again, we just need to, to get there and, yeah, and yeah. check that it's going to work. A Salate says, if you get enough money to start clinical trials, how long might it take to really know that AIP2 works? Um, in the lab, it seems like AIP2 is working within a few days. Um, wow. So it is very quick. Um, it's essentially focusing on um, the gut and some tissues in there that are really good at making these regulatory cells that populate all the mucosal tissues, so not just the lung and not just the gut. Um, and it works very quickly, and it seems that uh, the protection is quite long-lasting. Um, in terms of reprieve of symptoms, um, depends on the amplitude of the inflammation, obviously, um, but we expect this to work fairly rapidly. Alistair, having heard this, mm. how do you envisage that this might completely change or maybe not change the way that you're treating your patients now? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said before, it, it, it's potentially another tool in the arsenal. And, um, uh, you know, you know I, I guess we, there's certain things that will stay the same for everyone. I mean, everyone will, um, we always look to define people's asthma, find out exactly what type of yep. inflammation they are affected by, um, manage any contributing uh, medical conditions which is making their asthma worse. So there's, there's many things which we would keep doing the same way we're currently doing. Um, how it would change things? Well, I mean, uh, like I said, we have a gold standard of treatment, the, the corticosteroids, the, ste the steroids, whether it's inhaled or, or oral. and. Um, it's just just having that, that that other option and which you know different patients are different and everyone's medication regimen is slightly tailored and um, it'd be great to have something else as well <laughs> what percentage of your patients now would asthma make as a thoracic physician oh uh, yeah I mean so well I mean I, I have a special interest in asthma so a high percentage probably probably almost half of them um, 
but you know, like I guess even for for my colleagues who um, who may not necessarily have the asthma interest, it's it's huge. Uh, I mean, asthma is one of the most common chronic diseases in Australia, and that is, that extends beyond uh, specialists as well in primary care for our GP colleagues. Once again, asthma is such a uh, major part of their practice. And that's the question that we had earlier. Is asthma more common, Alistair, or are we just more aware of it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it could be could be one or the other. Uh, it, it's hard to define that, to be honest. Um, it could it could be just we're more aware of it. I mean, some some of these uh, patients may be those we may have labelled as having smoking related COPD in the past, and now that the smoking rates are a bit lower or a lot lower, uh, it might be unmasking um, mm. uh, patients, and we're now able to define their inflammation a lot better. So 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 we are actually better at diagnosing at diagnosing it. So it's entirely conceivable we're just better at finding it. Um, it's also um, it's also plausible that, that it's just more common. common. You know, we, we sort of talk about um, like the hygiene hypothesis and how um, people are, <laughs> people may not be as exposed to um, allergens in childhood as much and that might contribute to uh, increasing rates of asthma. Now, did your it's research hard to find that out? That. Yeah, um, there, there is a strong interest in understanding um, how immune education takes place uh, in, at, an early young, at, er, at an early age, and this is particularly important for immune regulatory cells. Uh, and we found that uh, pathogens and uh, uh, culturing, if you want, cultivating a very good, healthy, uh, diverse microbiome is, is also very important. And that's where um, researchers have started to really look closer at parasites because they also live in the um, gastrointestinal tract in the small intestine and they have this direct interaction uh, with the microbiome and the immune system and uh, that's where was coined the old friend hypothesis mm. as well which is really related to the hygiene hypothesis mm. um, where these pathogens are believed to be essential in early childhood to educate the immune system and the fact that we've eradicated uh, a lot of these pathogens, I mean, we still have um, cold viruses and a lot of different bacteria we used to um, several decades ago, and definitely very few parasites nowadays. I mean, it depends on the region of Australia where you live. You might be exposed more than uh, other, you know, urban um, areas, but um, these pathogens are clearly missing, and we think that they are now um, we, we're missing essentially this essential, this essential educational signal um, to have a robust, um, well-developed immune regulatory. I understand, Wanda. Um, I, I really would love to cater to everybody, but um, we would have to take uh, a stepwise approach uh, for uh, going into market. And first, we would need to do a uh, one-site trial, uh, which is how it normally takes place. First, it's safety, then it's measuring efficacy, and then usually it would go on to a multi-site. So all this, uh, all these different steps need to happen, uh, and unfortunately, we can't start right away with a multi-site. Um, and sadly, I would say, like the only limitation is seriously is funding. Um, we could go all out. I'm sure Alistair would love to get on board with this, but um, we would have to take baby steps with what can be afforded with the funding we have. And thanks, Wanda, for being up a little bit early for our Facebook Live. We appreciate the time difference there. Thanks, Severin. Um, Rob, follow-up question. Do you think A2 will relieve symptoms of hay fever and inflamed sin sinus as well as asthma relief? This is going to be a very big trial. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rob, I'm right there with you because yeah. I have chronic hay fever as well. Um, yes, because so hay fever, um, inflamed sinuses, they all have the same uh, basic uh, um, inflammatory processes that are in asthma, it's that lack of immune regulation. So um, I hope, yes, uh, ape 2 should be also very um, beneficial for these conditions. Um, I really would like eventually to move into uh, food allergy because I think that there's a very good, there's a very important need there as well. And it's likely that it will 
I mean, we're hoping that it will work because, again, it's about immune regulatory responses not happening normally. And ap 2 is that's what it does. It, it promotes these responses and restores them to the way they should have been. Thank you so much. And if ape true, ape 2 is trial, this is from Anna and approved for asthma, will it still need additional trials to also be used for other allergies and autoimmune conditions? Or once approved, could it be repurposed straight away? That's a toughie. Yeah. Um, because there's um, multiple things into play here. Um, for one, uh, ape 2 would have to be a new tool in the arsenal of respiratory physicians and maybe GPs at some point. Um, doctors will need to see the longer evidence to see how beneficial mm -hmm. the side effects, those that weren't really assessed in the uh, initial clinical trials. Um, and then eventually, once we have this confidence that it works for one indication, then usually pharmaceutical companies will try to also determine if there are other indications that the medicine can be used for. Um, based on how it works, it is quite likely that it would be um, an original understanding from the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical partner right. interested in picking it up that it will eventually get repurposed for other indications. How fast this will go, um, it really depends on um, the the therapeutic good administration um, uh, giving the clear um, for trialing or going into other indications. Once safety and efficacy has been shown in the first trial, um, I'm not entirely sure, and we would need to check with a commercial partner, yeah. whether it would have to be started um, being, uh, being allowed to be prescribed for these other indications. If you've just joined us, we're Facebook Live, QMI Berghofer from our buildings in Hurston, Queensland, Australia. We've had some great questions. It's Ask Me Anything Asthma, and I think we pretty much have covered a lot of ground at this stage. Mm -hmm. Nick, you might have just joined us. What stage is the trial at? Well, we want to be in a trial. Yeah. Pre-prepared questions, they've been really good, and we have one now coming through from Mimi again. How did you discover that the hookworm protein works? Great question. Well, great story. Yeah, yeah. So the the hookworm story is quite interesting, and um, it came uh, basically from physicians and surgeons um, like Alistair, um, who were interested in finding novel treatment uh, for diseases that are very um, under catered, I guess. Um, and so, live hookworm therapy was what was initially used for um, inflammatory bowel disease and clinical and celiac disease. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, I was involved in, with the research team uh, at some stage because it started uh, before I got into this. Um, and uh, uh, hookworms were trialed in IBD and celiac. And we had such an encouraging results um, that uh, um, people like myself and collaborators started digging further. And that's how APE2 was found. Um, we basically collected the worms and we just let them swim in a little bath of um, tissue culture media. And we collected that, uh, well, we call it soup. It's just that complex mixture of everything that the worm produces when it's in the host. And then we just went by elimination. But luckily, we found that APE2 was one of the most abundant proteins right. that were in that soup, yeah. that was in that soup. And, um, we just tested it uh, in the lab and we found absolutely phenomenal results. And that's why, um, how we got excited and got into this really. Um, but worms are extremely interesting. <laughs> You'd have to love them to get into this research. I, I should just be disclaimer, I'm not a parasitologist. I'm really focused right. on the immunology right. side, uh, but they are pretty interesting beasts and really tiny. So not as scary as they might look on the photos. <laughs> Do you get questions about this, the origin of this in your practice? I don't actually as much, uh, yes. but I'm more prepared yes. to answer it now than now uh, yeah. <laughs> when I do. Well, the stories I've heard, you gave them to people, the hookworms, of people who were severely, highly anaphylactic in response to gluten. They started with a tiny speck of pasta. By the end of the trial, they were eating a big bowl of pasta a day. Mm. And um, story has it, that some of them refused to give the hookworms back at the end of the trial because of the life-changing ability to have a bowl of pasta at a restaurant. You're right, Claire. I mean, celiac can be horrendous. Um, 
uh, again, it's like asthma. People think that if you go on a, a gluten-free diet, you'll be fine. But the reality is the sensitivity to gluten builds up to the yeah. point where um, not only an accidental exposure can give very violent um, inflammatory responses, but then mm -hmm. it can evolve in some patients with um, projectile vomiting within two hours of accidental exposure. Mm. So you can imagine how crippling this is, uh, where you feel like you just cannot get out of your house um, yeah. in case you're like this in public. Um, and so, yeah, so these uh, participants, uh, once the infection was established, they were uh, told to consume pasta every single day until they had to consume a whole bowl of pasta um, and they were um, almost symptom free, like they, they were absolutely no reaction just because the worm was there. That's brilliant. I would have been so, so excited. Uh, we've got one more question. Shannon says, would A2 only, when we say A2, if you just joined us, it's anti-inflammatory protein 2 and uh, found by Associate Professor Severin Navarro, who's with us, and Dr. Alastair Cook and we're calling it ape 2 for the purposes of Facebook Live today. Would it only work on people who already have asthma or would it prevent? So both. Um, again, that's preclinical evidence. Uh, ape 2 works on established asthma uh, and also when given at a very young age, it prevents sensitization from taking place. So mm -hmm. that means no asthma whatsoever. Uh, again, that's all preclinical. So um, we, can, we can only imagine and we can only hope it will work in humans, but we need to check because it's such a phenomenal uh, new drug that um, it deserves attention and being developed. Thank you, everyone. I think you have accepted the brief of Ask Me Anything Asthma. We've covered a lot of ground here. Thank you so much, Dr. Alistair Cook. Thanks for having Thoracic me. Thoracic physician, it was a pleasure to have you and both of you in the room together, Associate Professor Severin Navarro, who's the head of our mucosal immunology lab here at QIMR Berghofer. So as you can see, these changes would be pretty big, but we do need money to get to the next step because it can't stop here, it's just too promising. So if you can help by donating any amount at all, it really may change the lives of those people living with asthma and those people really struggling to live with severe asthma. So to do all that, go to qimrberghofer.edu.au and look out for the full podcast from Severin coming up soon at that same website. Thanks for joining us for QIMR Berghofer's Facebook Live. Thank you both. Thanks.